Welcome to today's book review. Today we're going to talk about, what, can you guess? I gave it away if you watched a while ago. No. Okay, I'll get to you. Boys and Sex by S Susan. That's Susan Orlean is a different book. That's the library book by Peggy Ornstein. Boys and Sex. So let me just tell people, if you have dealt with um, sexual misconduct before, it's probably specific, I think, of ladies, but definitely anyone, um, you may not want to watch the rest of this because it might be tough. I, I found it tough. Let's dig in. Let's start this review by, with a quote, with a quote, from the book. Page 13, you can find this in the hardcover copy. And it says, Feminism may have afforded girls an escape from the constraints of conventional femini femininity, offer them alternative identities of women and language with which to express the myriad of problems that have no name, but it has made few inroads with boys. Now, with that early quote, Peggy Ornston sets kind of the tone for the book that while there's been a lot of progress, and there's still far to go, but there's been a lot of progress in women and the identities they can have and that they can, they don't just have to be a mom, they don't just have to be servant, I was going to say servant, servant, to their families, that they can do other things, they can have other, you know, produce other things. Um, in many ways, the views that men are socialized to espouse and that they have to put up with, they're stuck in 1955, to use her term. So that's what we'll talk a bit about how that happens and and what that's what the book talks about how it happens. Um, one of the big themes is that so you heard of locker room talk, right? I think there's even Trump uh, grabbing the pussy. Like that type of talk is not so much about the sex, really. It's like what woman wants to be grabbed by the pussy, right? Uh, who is it? Uh, the Queen of Shitty Robots did a pussy grabs back video, which I've never seen, but I was just reading an article about her and Wired, so I know this happened. Um, and like that. I mean, you re you heard that, and yet, uh, <laughs> and yet people vote for him um, because that isn't asserting sex because that's not sexy. That's not like a woman does go. Oh, I hope that happens to me. But the thing is, oh, get your hands away. That's asserting masculinity through control of women's bodies, and that's what sex talk uh, in general in the locker is all about. Is about showing how masculine, how amazing I am because I can control a woman's body. See, that's my sexual prowess. Then, so. And that's not good. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, it's terrible is what it is. So she talks about that, like page 28 talks about this and page 32. Now, when it comes um, to porn, we have, uh, there's a few reasons that they say porn is appealing. Number one is it's easily accessible on the internet now, which it talks about on page 42. Um, it may be more important because it doesn't reject men. Men don't feel rejected by porn on page 49. I actually saw this in Jordan Peterson's what I call terrible book, 12 Rules for Life. And he says it like this. Women have been making men self-conscious since the beginning of time. They do this primarily by rejecting them, but they do it also by shaming them if men do not take responsibility. And there's some more there, but like basically he's saying like women reject and shame us and it's this so terrible thing. <sighs> and porn can't. And Okay, great. You also see in iGen, which I reviewed, I'll link that somewhere that um, Jean M. Twenge writes this, good researcher. She talks about how, especially in relationships, but like in general, iGen, I'm not sure if iGen and Gen Z are the same, I have to look that up, but iGen in her terms um, is avoiding any type of rejection whatsoever, any type of bad feeling, anything, they don't want it. So they turn to porn because again, they don't get it there. Um, yeah, and again, people feel valid, men feel validated by Jordan Peterson's stupid talk like this where they say, yes, I am rejected and it is a woman's fault. It's not a woman's fault, like... It's not a woman's fault. And you're not entitled to sex either. So I talk about early porn use in this where it's uh, highly correlated with increased sexual aggression. Uh, you're going to have more partners, higher pregnancy rates, more STDs, a whole bunch of stuff like this. And you devalue women more when you watch porn because really in porn is mostly about uh, women being there for a man's body, for his fulfillment. It talks about that on page 47. Um, and both men and women view this unreal depiction of sex as what it should be, right? So a man being able to thrust away for an hour and a half, like, I don't know, I've been married for 18 years, it's not happened. <laughs> it's, it's not happened. And it doesn't happen in the video either, because they're getting injections and steroids and other stuff to like, prop them up, because you can't literally you just you can't be hard that long without being raw too. Um, now, an interesting question that Ornstein encouraged us to ask as men is when you talk about um, nailing a woman, I pounded on like stuff like that. Um, is did she enjoy it? Okay, well, did she enjoy that? 
And most men are left going, uh, because they weren't thinking about that. They were thinking about showing their sexual prowess and their stamina, which, you know, because of porn in many ways, that they had all this amazingness for a woman and that's what they should be interested in. And, and, and the thought of a woman's pleasure doesn't even enter into it in their minds. Um, uh, I can say, again, as an aside, 18 years of marriage, I, ha I have the best sex when I'm making sure she has good sex, too. Another big issue is the influence of hookup culture and the thought that boys just always want it and that's all they want. They don't have any emotionally deeper level than just wanting to hook up and have sex. <sighs> Uh, and that's not the truth. Most boys actually prefer physical intimacy with someone they know, trust, they like, uh, and they have better. They would rate their sexual intimacy as better. Page uh, 225 talks about that. Now, as far as sex and hookup culture, only 35 to 40 percent of hookups actually result in sex. Uh, another 35 to 40 percent is just kissing and groping, and the rest of it is some other type, say oral or you know something else that's not actual uh, vaginal intercourse. Um, Another prevalent thing in hookup culture is you got to get drunk and like really drunk. Uh, I've talked about this in uh, Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell uh, a while ago, that the the really drunk, the warm up to getting really drunk now is what heavy drinkers used to like just that was their whole night a couple of you know, 10 years, 20 years ago. Um, he also addresses in that book Gladwell and it talks about this in, in uh, Boys and Sex as well. But I think Gladwell did a better job of this, which is funny because I didn't actually love that book. But he did a better job of this explaining how like when you're drunk, your inner monologue, your inner life is basically not showing well on the outside. So you're totally disconnected. You're mismatched. And then the person reading you basically can't read you at all. And that's how we have. That's how it contributes to some of the stories you have of, you know, sexual misconduct, of rape, of stuff like that. Because you think you're saying no, but maybe you're not, maybe you're not saying no. Uh, that's not a great way to say it. And, and typically the guy on the other end doesn't, like, he, he basically can't read it. That's it. Uh, another thing I talk about in Boys and Sex is that men are going to read women's interactions with them through the eyes of what they want. So smiling at you is, oh, you're like, you clearly wanted sex. You smiled at me. Like, mm, that's not how it works, guys. Another thing with being drunk like that is that you cannot focus on any future consequences. You can only focus on exactly what's happening right now. So you can't think like, oh, I better make sure I get consent because you literally don't have the brain. You don't have the bandwidth going back to scarcity. Um, you don't have the bandwidth. You tunnel in on um, the immediate need and you cannot think of future. So scarcity comes into there too. Gladwell talked about that in talking to strangers. Scarcity talks about the same thing. Uh, tunneling, getting focused on what's happening right now with no thought to future consequences because you literally do not have the bandwidth. You cannot think of anything in the future. Now, this is even compounded more for African and American male students where, no, I'll read their quote from the book, from Boys and Sex. African American students are, in general, less likely to drink to excess than whites and more likely to endorse gender equality, negating two essential preconditions for casual campus sex. They do this for a few reasons. Um, they do this because they're more likely to get accused of rape. They have to like put in way more work into consent, um, and they know it, so they do. Uh, yeah, and they like where a white student may get to stay at a school um, with consequences. A black student is just expelled, and then Asian men get what they call yellow panic. Um, that's oh, sorry, yellow peril, which she talks about on page one fifty, um, where Asian men are just viewed as undesirable. That's it; they're just undesirable. They'll have. You know, we view them as having a small penis and not very sexual, like no good sexual prowess there as a crew, as a, opposed to black male students that are like unbridled sexual aggression, just hidden behind a thin veneer of, you know, civility. That sucks for both, for both, uh, racial groups that she talked about there. And I'm sure there's other things, but like basically as a white guy, I get a pass on all of it, which is stupid, <laughs> stupid. That's what it is. So now finding a better path forward. What does she suggest really at the end of this book as like a good way to, to move forward with this? So for parents of boys, she suggests that you need to do what parents of girls do. You need to surround your boys with lots of strong role models that are female, strong, independent, well thought out women, which is what like, I got three girls. So we've got lots of like, you know, princess in black or lots of other things. We do Goldie blocks. We do a lot of things that show like women is smart and strong and knows what she's doing to help socialize our girls to think that as well. But they don't do that for boys. She talks about this in page 63. Boys just don't get that. That's, they don't worry about it. So that's something you need to do if you want to socialize your boys to think of women as strong and valuable. Um, now, as they get older, they need, boys need strong male model, strong, strong role models, male role models, usually. Uh, male role models is a good one, but any role model that's going to tell them that Talking about women like that is not okay, right? This can be the coach that they hear some locker room talking about boys. That is not how we talk about women. That is not okay. And 
that does not show that you've done any, like that does not show that you're more masculine because you nailed something. Like that's not even, that's not okay. So we need to do that. And you can even, I have a one running friend and he more than once he's said something that's got close to, uh, close kind of locker room talk-ish from back when he, back years and years ago, he says, and I've run faster. <laughs> then he can't talk because I'm faster than him. But I need to instead stop and say, this is not okay. We don't talk like that. And I have done this biking before. We had, um, oh, a couple years ago, uh, the men, one of the guys whistled at a running woman and I actually stopped my road bike and said, hey, I'm sorry about that. That's not okay. No one should treat you like that. I'm going to go talk to him. And I'm sure that was even intimidating for her to have someone whistle and then suddenly someone stop and it was like in the middle of nowhere. And when I went and told him, I like, I will never ride with you again if you do that. This is not okay. And he kind of justifies like, no, that's not okay. So doing more of that and being bold enough to do that um, is a good thing. And I, you know, I, I kept riding with the group and he stopped, at least in my presence. So that was good. But doing that long term all the time is something that men need to do to say to other men, this is not okay. No cat calls. And when my wife goes running, the cat calls the other things, like especially in the summer when she's dressed for the weather, for the hot weather. Um, yeah, I, something I never even think about and never have to deal with. Although I have had comments on my cycling legs before, but I never feel, you know, like that's a sexually aggressive comment. It's usually by another guy. He's like, those are nice legs. So anyways, something that men need to not say about women for sure. And need to, other men need to reinforce. We can't say that. Another thing that men do is here. Yeah. Another thing that men often do is that they know how a man should act. They know how they should act with a woman, get consent, all that stuff, how they should behave. And as soon as they when it's brought forward to them and someone says, hey, but you didn't do that, they expand their view of what is acceptable to include their behavior. They don't say, oh, you're right, I shouldn't have, and then realize, because they want to view themselves as a good guy. And I think most people most people would fall into this in some level. They want to view themselves as someone that is good, that doesn't do certain acts, and when they are confronted with the fact that they do these certain acts, they expand their definition of what is okay. We need to not do that. We need to confront it head on and be like, you know what, I, I did make a mistake, that's unacceptable. Another thing that men do and we need to stop is the boys also tend to uh, equate enthusiastic participation in any sexual act, such as kissing, with enthusiastic consent for vaginal intercourse, page 172. We need to tell our boys, uh, everyone, more about consent. What consent means, that you have to con con consent at every step. Um, even in a marriage, I actually I probably ask a lot. I know that I'm sometimes like, oh, you're ruining the mood because I'm asking. Um, but getting consent at every stage in the sexual process to like say, hey, like, is this okay? What do you want? And, and have more like, not, you know, are, you know, will, will you give oral? It's like, well, what do you like to do? What do you like? What are you up for? Are you into, right? So asking, are you into some sexual act? That's more important and, and how we do it better. And then she talks briefly about the Dutch model, which is educates far younger than we would. So most of North America is like, don't, just don't, <laughs> which is not effective. It's, yes, uh, I, you know, as young as four, I think she says, but they're talking about body parts, which is important. Like, we, you name the body part what it is, and you say no one should be touching you there. So that's an important thing. Um, Dutch starts much younger. They do sex ed, like, through every grade, all the time. They continue to come back at that, and they continue to teach consent. They continue to really just drive home how important it is to get consent. And Dutch parents are much more likely, oh, you've been in a relationship for a little while. Sure, yeah, sure your partner, your your boyfriend, your girlfriend can sleep over, and they understand that sex might happen. Um, and the result of all this like open talk about sex is that sex happens less, it happens later. It's less likely to result in pregnancy. It is less likely to result in STDs. And like basically all the bad things that come with early sex don't happen. So maybe we need to stop being prudes and embrace that. So my final thing, uh, should you read it? Let's actually do one quote. Uh, kind of a uh, how men are socialized and some of the detriments to that. By adulthood, the majority of men have difficulty not only expressing, but even identifying their emotions. Page 228. So if you're raising boys, you need to read this. Uh, you need to read this and you need to change how you're raising your boys. You need to take proactive steps to make sure that they treat women how you probably know they want to be treated. It's most men, myself included, absolutely, um, treated women differently when we were teens and they had a lot of hormones raging and, the, and that I would even dream of treating a woman now. Uh, would never, never dream of it. Um, yeah, so we need to take some of the steps that she suggests and educate our boys better. We need to socialize them better. As far as you should read this, uh, I think it's a really good read uh, with the caveat that if you have dealt with sexual aggression before directed at yourself, this might be a tough book to read. It probably is going to be a tough book to read. If you have uh, escaped the, the porn industry, we'd say, or something, you know, you've had, 
honestly, as most women have, um, had sexual aggression uh, towards you from a man, this might be a tough book. So maybe don't read it then. But if you're raising boys, if you're a man, you need to read the book. And you need to read it and you start taking it to heart. You need to stop acting like an asshole. So that's my book recommendation book recommendation for today. You'll find a link to it below. You'll find a link to all the books. You'll actually find a full written version of this. It goes into some more detail, shows some other books that it relates to, gives you some more quotes, and gives you footnotes for everything. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can make sure you don't miss any by subscribing below. Make sure you hit that little bell icon so you get notifications if you like notifications. Although, I gotta be honest, I hate them. If you'd like to support the channel, like to make sure that the videos keep coming, that the content keeps coming, you can support me on patreon.com slash Curtis McHale. Have an awesome day.